Welcome to HC Nation, your guide to the best in AC content and the best in home theater gear, no matter what your budget is. I'm Patrick Norton. Hey, and I'm Robert Harris. And this is the House Velociraptor. Don't ask me why. <laughs> we have a lot of good stuff coming up in today's show, especially if you're hiding in the house or your dorm room, avoiding the great outdoors. I will say it's nice to see that only half of America is freezing right now, and the parts of America that should never freeze, like the Deep South, are actually back to being warm. This is exciting. That's a chill. Oh, my goodness. A chilling effect. <laughs> it's a chilling effect in a different way. It's still winter, right? Yes. For a few more weeks. But there's certain parts of the country that were like negative 4,000 degrees yeah. that aren't supposed to be negative 4,000 degrees. Do you love your Chromecast? I, I use it almost every day. Yes. Yes, I do. dollars What's your favorite app on the Chromecast? Netflix. I, Netflix. I am constantly streaming video straight to it via, via my Android app, which makes it super easy. But I also occasionally, if I'm on a PC website, I'm also just using uh, streaming from a browser page, too. So it's just handy. I love it. It's kind of interesting. Roku has decided they need to compete with the Chromecast. A tiny stick, big entertainment. Uh, obviously, what we're looking at here is the Roku streaming stick. $50, uh, definitely targeted at Chrome, Google's Chromecast. Uh, of course, it comes with a lot more channels built in right now. 1080p or 720p, 7.1 and 5.1 audio over HDMI, uh, ABGN 802.11, uh, and a full-size Roku remote, which I like, but unfortunately not the Roku 3 remote with the onboard headset jack and motion control for games, but it's a nice, uh, it's actually a really, really nice remote. If you've never used the Roku remote, uh, well, it's nice. I'm just going to say that one last time. Comes with a wall wart because there's really no power over HDMI that's particularly usable. Uh, and if you take a look Except at maybe of, MHL, that was the one thing true. I remember the the Roku streaming stick was was uh, usable for actually with that port where you didn't need that secondary right. power. That's something I haven't tested yet with Chromecast, and I kind of doubt it actually supports MHL power to power that device. But eh, that's something I can go try easily enough. You should turn around for a second so people can see that you, you, you this is probably the number one enthusiast of MHL technology in the United I, States today. I thought, I thought the Do 4K was the way to go. So. That's pretty For today's funny. fashion statement. What's kind of odd about the streaming stick is Roku already had a $50 uh, Roku One Box. Oh. Um, well, maybe they're... Both, thousand entertainment channels, built-in wireless, Roku Search. Um, to be discontinued, perhaps. Perhaps. Well, it'll be interesting to find out. Um, it's interesting. The Roku 2 now has the remote headphone jack, too, for $79.99. That's um, a nice upgrade. That is a, yeah, it's a really, it, you know, it doesn't do Apple stuff, but if you want Amazon Prime and Netflix and all the other good stuff, it's definitely Yeah, worth, uh, there's something the Chromecast doesn't do is Amazon's instant video service. So. Yeah. I, and, and there's no sign of that coming anytime soon. That was my next question, is are they gonna open up the Chromecast to more apps? For example, like an HD Nation well, app. they have. It's there, it's but there. no. <laughs> April, pre-order now, ships in April. We're gonna get hands on as soon as we can. A recent email we received asked us to check out a product that converts HDMI to composite video. And this is interesting. <laughs> okay, okay, breathe, breathe. <laughs> This <sighs> hurts Robert's soul. Here's the thing. There's a reason people might want this. If uh, they have no money for an HDTV and they have an older television, or if for some insane reason the only input on their HDTV is... Composite video. video. The, 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 basically the lowest form of life in the video connection food chain out there. This would be a good time, though, to just go over the basic cable connections you're going to find. Not only the cables you can buy, but the connections you'll find on the rear of a TV. And to show you what's better than the composite connection, start right off the bat with what is considered everyone's friend, HDMI, the high-definition multimedia interface. This is the cable you should know everything about. It's a single cable that transmits standard-def, high-def, ultra-high-def video along with surround sound audio if it's available. And it's digital in nature, and that prevents any loss of detail and it's a single plug, so it's pretty easy to use. I have an example of that right here that actually shows an HDMI cable on one end that is actually backward compatible, you could call it, with a DVI cable. It's actually using similar video technology. Now, I'm not gonna get the audio that would be going through an HDMI cable to come out of a DVI cable, but just to let you know that these converter cables offer perfect conversion, and it's a great way to go if you're trying to connect an older PC to, say, your home theater gear. Now, that next step down in terms of the great cable connections is component video, component. It's a three-wire analog connection that supports standard and high-def video, but no audio. You have to run that separately. Now, like HDMI, component vi video delivers all the color quality and detail quality at, at full quality. That's the key to it. It will give you it will give you as good of quality as you have from your source devices. Moving further down the food chain into standard definition only territory, we have two connectors to talk about. One is S-Video. It's a single cable with 
two pins, or actually four pins total, a two wire setup though, that delivers S-Video with full detail. You're getting full resolution out of your SD signal, but color information is gonna be more compressed compared to say using a component video connection or HDMI. Finally, that lowest point on the food chain. We're talking specifically the yellow cable, but you might notice these are all using what they call RCA jacks. So just because these cables are colored differently, there's really no difference between that, say, and a component cable. You, you could swap these out, providing you connect them similarly. Uh, it's The wires are just simply different color, but we're talking composite. Evil, 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 why? Well, yeah, it supports standard def, and, and it's a single cable, so that makes it kind of easy. But you're basically having color and detail information by the fact that you're having to mix those signals together into one wire stream, in a sense, or one signal stream. And it's a lossy process that can often introduce things like noise and other unseemly artifacts that need to be usually corrected by a good TV down the road. So yes, there are products out there that will convert a great HDMI output, say from a Blu-ray or DVD player, into a composite connection. But you really never want to do it because right. you are just chopping the signal up left and right and sacrificing color and detail along the way. One of the things you can do if you have an older uh, television that will not support the new specs, you know, the, the, the less expensive Roku boxes, for example, still offer uh, standard analog television outputs. You can still, if you search really, really hard, find DVD players and VHS and Blu-ray players that will support it. Again, like the man said, find an HDMI supported device. Totally, or, or if you have that older console device, like maybe the, the Nintendo Wii or right. PlayStation 2 or, or any of those consoles, they all support component video output. Look mm -hmm. for an adapter cable, and if your TV has that connector on the back, that red, blue, green connector, this one, use it because that will give you much better, you'll get full video resolution and you'll get full color quality out of it. And it makes a dramatic difference compared to using, especially compared to composite, but even more so compared to S-Video as well. And, and regardless of how you're doing, move up the food chain in terms of your connections and, and enjoy better <laughs> picture quality, please. Well, we have Mr. Heron frothing. Chris <laughs> emailed us. He's got a question about Sharp's new Q Plus series TVs. The new Sharp LC60 SQ15U is advertised as a 1080p HDB screen that is capable of displaying near 4K quality at normal HD screen prices. The only three reviews on Amazon say it's incredible, but that could be the three Sharp employees who actually own this new screen. I'd been looking at buying a Samsung UN60 F7100 or 7500, but now I'm considering the Sharp. What do you think, Robert? Is near 4K possible? Thank you, Chad. I, I'm digging what Sharp was doing last year, and right. their, their 2014 TVs are looking good too, but specifically we're talking about the new Q Plus series TVs, AKA Quatron Plus, that features a split sub-pixel design that effectively doubles the pixel count to, as, as to quote the good folks at Sharp, deliver 16 million subpixels. That's an astounding 10 million more than conventional full HD TVs. So if I'm not mistaken though, a 4K UHD HD TV is actually quadrupling the number of pixels. Of pixels. Yeah. Now, they're getting into counting subpixels. Now, what the hell is a subpixel? Now, well, it's like a pixel, but less. <laughs> If you count the pixels on a screen, if you could move and magnify them really well, you'll see that every pixel on that TV is actually several, in most cases, three subpixels that are colored red, blue, and green. Three of these together create one pixel. And when you group those together, well, red, blue, and green is that tradition, the red, blue, and green technology. Now, looking to what Sharp is doing with their fourth color technology, they add this fourth color, yellow in particular, into the mix. And that's what they're basically adding up here. So when we talk about 1080p HD TVs having exactly two plus million pixels, you multiply that by three, the number of subpixels. It gives you that six million number individually controlled. 6,220,800. Exactly. I'm reading here. Every one of those subpixels is right. individually controlled on most HD TVs. Now, Sharp's original Quatron technology that I showed you the picture of here, ups that to the four subpixel count or gets you to what would be eight plus million subpixels. Now, the Q plus technology, well then split those subpixels again, reaching that magical 16 million number that Sharp is using. Sharp claims now, that here's the interesting part about this particular new Q plus tech, that the adjacent pixels on one of their Q plus TVs can actually share subpixels, providing a picture with fewer aliasing artifacts. Basically the bottom line really is that Sharp's new Q plus series TVs they are 1080p screen TVs with a finer pixel structure than you're gonna find compared to any other similarly sized TV. Technically though, it's still a 1080p screen and it still has, you know, 
two million seventy three thousand pixels or whatever. It, it is. does, but because they're splitting all the subpixels in half, right. uh, that could, with the proper processing, they're calling revolution or revolution revelation technology. Uh, this could offer, especially at closer viewing distances less aliasing artifacts. And because of the way they're doing the split pixel sharing, okay. they can offer greater brightness too than most other LCD TVs. But this is the kind of thing you really want to put in the lab to see, is it going to be able to, the big question really, if I have a 1080p TV, uh, is, it, is it providing at least as good of an image quality compared to uh, using the Q Plus technology with your 1080p sources? And if I <laughs> feed it a 4K signal, it's degrading that down to 1080p and then reconverting it up to that 16 million plus subpixel count. So, so you're not calling this marketing fluff. Not a, there is some in there, uh, you but know. It, it is entirely dependent on the quality of the processing done by the components in between the input on the back of the television and the output to the screen. And if that does a good job, it could, in theory, off additional sort of probably more on the sort of brightness scale than anything else. I think the brightness too, and and if you sit a little bit closer, I think if you were sitting the exact same distance from two similarly sized screens, one with the Q Plus with the with the 16 million subpixels and one with the regular count of right. pixel structure, you would see that it would be a finer looking screen if you got up close to it, and at, at certain distances, I think you would get perhaps less aliasing artifacts. Perhaps. But that's really something we need to get side by side on and, and take some equivalent pictures to see if it really does help or not. One of the reasons you're going to see a lot more experimentation with sort of brightness and contrast in HDTVs is partially because, yeah, they want darker blacks, they want brighter brights, they want the ability to put this sort of the sunrise over the, the mountains and still have the details of the mountains and not lose sort of the, the stuff going on with the sun and the sky and all that. But the thing is, is the way our eye evolved was essentially to detect motion in dangerous environments. And we do a much better job of looking at, it's kind of funny, right? we, we do a much better job detecting brightness and contrast than we do with color. Oh, totally. And there's only so much we can do with color. <laughs> there is. And, and that's one of the reasons, too, you go back and look at how, how, how compression technologies work overall. That's one of the reasons we squeeze color more than we squeeze detail, because we notice color less. But right. I'll, I'll just be curious to see if this TV can deliver, the, the Q Plus TVs in particular, should be delivering better brightness. And for, for ultra-large screens, right. you should hopefully have fewer aliasing artifacts, but this is the stuff we good. will test in the lab when we get one of these sets in. When you get to an 80, 75, 80, 100 inch LCD, those pixels start looking really big. Their 90 inch screen yeah. really has some monster sized pixels on it. Uh, for a 1080p TV, that is something I would love to see with split pixel technology or split sub pixel technology to help smooth out those aliasing artifacts and, and other things that can make you know big screen viewing uh, less, less convincing when you're up close. One way to test out how 1080p content looks on your screen, well, we talk to you, we tell you, look at Blu-rays, or you want to see how something sounds in your home theater, get a reference quality disc. You know what else you can do? You can take a look at the latest and greatest games. Of course, if you're like me, you probably don't want to spend 60 bucks for new titles. Try our sponsor, Gamefly. They have thousands of new and classic titles, consoles, handhelds, although for us, here in the HD environment, we're talking about consoles. You can get a 30-day free trial if you go to Gamefly.com slash HDNation. You'll even be able to rent Titanfall when it releases on Xbox 360 and Xbox One. I personally am going to build a $500 gaming PC that's going to kick the Xbox One's ass playing Titanfall. Just saying. Just saying. Boom. Yeah. Boom. $150 GPU, kick the Xbox One's ass. Unbelievable. Oh my goodness. New Blu-ray is usually street on Tuesdays. Not so for the Hunger Games Catching Fire. The 2013 Jennifer Lawrence blockbuster becomes available this Friday, March 7th. Blu-ray.com called the DTS HD Master Audio 7.1 soundtrack, quote, incredibly well detailed, bombastic, and immersive, as in reference quality to show off your sound system. Gave a thumbs up to the video quality. The extras, not so much. Possibly because if you scroll down here, we're seeing something we're seeing more of with Blu-ray releases. There are special editions for like Best Buy and Target, which makes me wonder if Target has the three disc set. Did Target get all of the fantastic extras? Other notable releases this week include 12 Years a Slave. This is an extraordinary story of Solomon Northrup, who's a free black man from upstate New York, kidnapped, sold into slavery in the pre-Civil War South, beautifully shot, and Chiwetel Ejiofor's performance is outstanding. He is an extraordinary actor. Um, just amazing, and I'm not just saying that because he was in Firefly. This is an incredible movie. Go see it if you get a chance. By the way, Universal is filling out its back catalog. They dropped Far and Awake, Fried Green Tomatoes, Intolerable Cruelty, and Somewhere in Time on Blu-ray this week. It is going to be a good month for Blu-ray. Frozen was is coming. Forward to this. Frozen is coming with the world's best snow animation. Is it? Is yeah. it? Another movie I have yet to see. So. It's, it's good. <laughs> Hey, James from Texas caught our recent discussion. We were talking about optimizing projector picture quality, and he offered the 
Chris's excellent tip for minimizing those irksome keystone artifacts. Right. I quote, hey, with a fixed lens, i.e. no keystone adjustment available on the projector, tilt the screen to make it parallel to the lens plane. Derp. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Quoting still, many years ago when the theaters were large with steep balconies, the projection booth was at the rear of the balcony oh, wow. with the projectors aimed down to the screen uh, at a very steep angle. Tilting the screen was the only way to correct the keystone, oh. which made focusing a whole lot easier too. The audience was none the wiser. I know firsthand because I worked in such a theater. Man. Very cool. The only downside is like my, my just putting the screen back up where it comes down from the ceiling and there's just no way I'm going to be able to rock that critter. Unless you're like putting a stick or something behind there to hold it out or <sighs> something classy like that. <laughs> that ain't the way to do it. Speaking of classy, that's it for this episode of HC Nation. Kaboom. I just killed the Velociraptor. Oh. Please subscribe at revision3.com slash htnation at youtube.com slash htnation and you can talk to you us. Want please it all. And us. please email us your comments, your questions, or your suggestions or post them right down below. htnation at revision3.com at HD Nation. We love it all. Hey, until next time, thank you for watching.